and you've dubbed him as the CEO of EPO. Obviously, EPO a lot in the headlines lately um, with you know TJ Dillashaw's return and stuff. Where where exactly does that stem from? Why why is he the CEO of EPO? Because he's been doing EPO his whole career. It's so obvious, you know, his chemical imbalance in his body. You know, he's got the pimples all over his back, all over his face. You're a 35-year-old man. You don't have, you're not going through puberty and you're in your teens anymore. So guys, Derek, moreplaysmartaids.com. Today we are going to be talking about Kamaro, the Nigerian nightmare, Usman. This is one of the most highly requested Natty or Not videos of all time for like a fucking year I've been asked to do this one. If not longer, people have been reminding me and reminding me and now that he has an upcoming fight, it seemed like a reasonable time to revisit the subject. So there's a lot of random speculation that's been thrown out over the years. Um, Conor McGregor has made some bold statements. Covington has made some bold statements. Like I think it's worthwhile to at least visit those statements before we lay out more of the context. Like there's a lot of a lot of points I want to like I curated to kind of present the overall picture here and then be able to give my stance on it too. Because there are a lot of guys just throwing out fucking long ball accusations with this statement like oh look at the fucking track marks on his stomach look at the acne on his back look at this look at that so mcgregor is uh very very outspoken about calling out guys he thinks are juice heads notable of them being calling out usman so this is um i don't even know how long ago at this point but it was within the last year Kamaru said, except when I touch you at 170, they go out. They don't even go out at 155 anymore for you. I finish people. You get finished. So obviously McGregor hasn't been on the hottest streak lately. McGregor says, relax there, carbuncles. You big spotty <laughs> backpox. You were ringside last time I fought at 170. 40 seconds is all it took. Why did you reschedule Burns fight? What was the reason? That was never given to the public. Why that already signed fight was then rescheduled. So... This is often brought up about how he um, had no excuse for this situation and a lot of people you know, speculated it was because he was trying to clear drugs out of his system or was not prepared to be, you know, fight clean essentially. Never in all my time in this business, which is long before all of these fucking bums, have I ever seen a signed fight get rescheduled with no reason what, given whatsoever. So said fighter can recover from undisclosed injuries. Excuse me, what? The fight is signed, sealed, ticket sold. Fuck these juice heads anyways. I don't give a bollocks. I'm just calling it as it is. I have the biggest balls in Ireland with two lump hammers attached to me elbows. <laughs> me elbows. Me back. Like me leg. My leg. Me back. Me back. Me fucking leg, bro. Send me in and I'll pop that big pimple. Get three belts to go with my three commas. So he mentions the... You know, bad acne, you know, the back knee, he's gonna pop the pimple, whatever. <laughs> and this is a commonly brought up thing is Usman's skin quality because one of the main side effects of anabolic steroid use is acne development. And especially when you're an adult, it's a lot more odd to get, you know, androgenic type side effects that are, you know, indicative of hormone exposure than would be in your teen years when you're going through puberty or something. Because again, wild hormone fluctuations ultimately at the end of the day, as well as androgen use can be the reason for. Now, acne breakouts can happen, frankly, are going to be more prevalent when you have just a wild hormone fluctuation, which is why even when you're crashing off of the cycle, you're getting off of gear and you're getting into your PCT. The worst breakout you ever get in general will be when you're like first getting on shit and then also when you're getting off it and you're in PCT, which is so paradoxical because when you're depriving yourself of androgens, you would think like, oh, I'm going to have no acne. When in reality, that's like the worst breakout you get is typically when you're coming off cycle. So... Anyways, here he is with, you know, the acne there that people always accuse him of, oh, this is clearly sauce related. Here he is at uh, um, Wayans and he can see the traps. Fucking thick back, bro. And he's got the acne climbing on the rear delts, the traps, the back. And here he is against uh, Masvidal. And you can see again, a more clear shot of the acne climbing along the rear delt, up the traps, all along the back a little bit down the back even like close to his lats like he's got 
back knee. It's not like bad back knee, but it's like he's got fucking back knee, dude. You know, like he definitely has back knee and it's pretty uh, widespread over his body. It's not disgusting necessarily. And it's like, I don't know, like the severity is not that extreme. And I would not say necessarily this is like, oh, clear sign. It's definitely a like notch on the belt though to at least keep in mind as we move forward. Another thing that people are often bringing up is the marks on his stomach. So for example, um, people, well, a lot of people don't realize he had a, like a legitimate hernia, um, which like people for some reason will look at hernias and think like, look at this bump. It must be a result of injecting shit or look at this bump. It's like some GH baby fucking like GH got fucking alien baby growing inside of you or something. Um, but most notably too, is these like marks on his stomach, you know, is he going to have like blatant, if you're injecting shit subcutaneously, or are you going to have blatant marks all over your stomach? Not necessarily. And would they be up here? Like, would you have marks up in your upper abs? No. And like anyone who uses PEDs and peptides or growth hormone or anything of that nature that requires, you know, subcutaneous administration or insulin even would tell you how dumb it is to tell a guy. <laughs> He's on PEDs from the fact that he's got marks on his like upper abs. Like you would see, if you were going to see marks, which you're not, they would be down here, like by his belly button, like closer to his shorts. It would be something that you would pinch the fat there and then administer your water-based peptides, your water-based or your EPO potentially, um, your GH, whatever it is. However, when it comes to EPO and skirting around test testing, because again, this guy is supposedly the CEO of EPO, which we're going to be getting into in a bit and dismantling the testing parameters of EPO, as well as if you can even get away with it right now and the scientific literature to support if that is indeed possible or not. Because again, this is something that is constantly under development. Would you even be doing it subcutaneously? No. Like for example, TJ Dillashaw, Apparently, the way he was administering it was subcutaneously. He mentions in his interview that he used Procrit. Like he mentions here with Ariel Hawani what he was using exactly. And he mentions the brand, the recombinant EPO that he was using. So you tested positive for EPO. Why did you take EPO? I took an anemia medication called Procrit, which the main ingredient was erythropoietin. Um, it, it helps rebuild red blood cells. And when you become uh, anemic, you, your red blood cells start to plummet, you lose energy. Um, I was on a super strict, you know, 1600 calorie diet and working too hard. Just, I, I pushed my body to the extreme, man. I mean, no excuses. I, I made the mistake of, uh, of uh, wanting to do something that hadn't been done. And So there, he mentions Procrit, which Procrit is a medication prescribed for anemia, like he mentioned. And it has, uh, it's actually epoetin alpha specifically. And it is recombinant EPO, to be specific. It is not totally bioidentical. It is something that can be identified through urine analysis. And it's something that would otherwise be picked up in a blood matrix through aberrations in your hematology through your biological passport, which would subsequently give you a red flag to look for it in the urine and do a higher, more expensive, higher analytical technique to actually get a direct confirmation as opposed to you know, like uh, like a biological footprint, essentially, which we're going to be getting into later. But notably, this thing is a medication prescribed and it is recombinant, meaning it was created in a lab using cell cultures. So this is not something that is truly bioidentical produced by your kidneys. It is something that is Basically, with the appropriate genetic engineering, this is an actual abstract of the commercial production of recombinant erythropoietins. The gene of interest, such as EPO, can be produced by a host cell. In the case of EPO production, the sequence of amino acids, as well as the amount of glycosylation, must be correct to achieve the desired efficacy in vivo. So in vivo versus in vitro. Talking about in humans versus in vitro in like a Petri dish. The chapter describes one method of EPO production using cells genetically engineered to secrete Recombinant EPO, human EPO. In this method of production, mammalian cells, which are capable of producing glycosylation forms with the desired efficacy in humans are typically selected as hosts. The host mammalian cells secrete the recombinant human EPO product into the medium environment in which they are cultured, making the remainder of production a matter of separating the recombinant human EPO product from the cells and other components in the cell culture broth. So if you actually go down the Procrit 
Um, insert, which probably no one fucking reads, um, it mentioned the synthesis of it as well as the molecular mass and all of the kind of specifics around it that might otherwise be useful for detection. Like here, epoetin alpha is a 165 amino acid erythropoiesis stimulating glycoprotein manufactured by recombinant DNA technology as a molecular weight of approximately 30,400 Daltons and is produced by mammalian cells into which the human EPO gene has been introduced. Product contains the identical amino acid sequence of isolated natural EPO. Procreate injection for intravenous or subcutaneous administration. It's formulated as a sterile, clear, colorless liquid in vials and multiple formulations. So again, before we circle back to the EPO thing, because that's, that's the main compound of concern here. Like he's the CEO of EPO. So that's why I'm giving like the context of this shit like so early in the video before we get into some of the other claims, because there's quite a few. So circling back to the introduction of everything, I kind of, I kind of went on a side tangent already of the pharmacology, getting a bit ahead of myself. But anyways, so Usman is fighting Covington again. If you don't know, Covington fucking hates his guts, thinks he sauces his mind out, but doesn't really understand the pharmacology. But we're going to get into that because he has some pretty specific claims about EPO injections, calling him the CEO of EPO. Um, I, but there are numerous individuals who have called him out. And historically, some of these individuals that have called him out have actually been correct about other individuals like, you know, TJ Dillashaw, other individuals that have come out and uh, even spoken about his teammates too, that eventually under scrutiny either popped, had some sort of aberration that was, you know, very suspect or their entire camp was kind of a under the microscope camp for its, uh, you know, like suspect behaviors or individuals that were just blatantly juicing or actually tested positive, which we're going to get into soon too about the black zillions. So again, this is a subreddit post that blew up. Um, can you do an analysis on Usman? He's always looking jacked, especially last night. Doesn't take away from the fact he's an incredible fighter, but genuinely, genuinely curious on your thoughts. Is this just goddamn insane genetics? So this is uh, UFC 261, um, flexing, looking fucking insane, six pack dialed in, chest striations, looking like a small, I don't know, like a fitness model essentially. All right, let's see. Yep, this is the answer to any top level professional athlete. What else is there to say? <laughs> Genetics plus injection. I'd like to see Derek's opinion too. This would be a good video in my opinion. I was thinking he looked super jacked last night too. Tough dude. He's on them, no solid food diet for sure. Um, let's see. Usman has both amazing genetics and takes PEDs. Anytime there's big paychecks to win in a sport, people will cheat. Gotta look at his legs too. He carries a ton of weight up top. Everybody's on steroids, Nate Diaz. Um, let's see. Ba -ba -ba. Okay, so a lot of speculation. He has been tested multiple times too, by the way. Like it's not like these individuals aren't meticulously tested or at least like are subject to randomized testing frequently throughout the year. And the scrutiny of the testing is relatively elaborate. They have a pretty comprehensive urine analysis and a baseline hematology profile that provides them a longitudinal data of a something called a biological passport, which is like a blood matrix that otherwise shows aberrations in their hematology to identify blood transfusions and or tip off potential EPO use. So this is again, Either a tip off for the um, for the uh, what's his fucking name TJ Dillashaw situation, or he simply had a blatant aberration in his blood work that then warranted the further EPO test. But in general, self admittedly, this is something they don't go after specifically on every single test. This is pulled out as a subsequent direct confirmation after the fact, after they have the kind of like evidence that something may be awry. So it's not like every single athlete is subject to EPO testing or growth hormone testing off the bat. These are more expensive, more specific, spe specialized tests that you would only pull out should it be warranted based on red flags essentially. So it's not like, you know, Dillashaw was always tested for EPO. It's not like Usman's potentially ever been tested for EPO. A fuck ton of people haven't been tested for EPO in the UFC because frankly, the budget doesn't support it, probably. And it's just not seen as a good allocation of funds when you could otherwise, you know, pick up the same likelihood of it via the red flags in the biological passport. But again, is that really the case? Does the literature support that you're not going to get away with skirting around the tests? 
are they still developing more advanced analytical techniques to pick it up given the lackluster shortcomings of the testing? We shall see soon. So anyways, obviously a big, highly requested thread. And uh, we get into some of the, the obvious first things we go to before we get into some of the deep dives of the pharmacology of this guy's history. Was he always this jack? We go back and look at him way back in the day. This is him in his wrestling days when he was much younger. And obviously he's packed on what appears to be like 20 pounds of muscle on this frame at least. Looks fucking way more jack now. Here he is again, much smaller. But again, there's no reason why you like people grow as naturals. You start somewhere. So obviously just seeing him here, it doesn't really indicate anything other than he started somewhere and he grew like fucking any of us did. Here he is at 20 years old, which I think is more relevant. Here he is fighting or sorry, wrestling, presumably in high level wrestling. Like he was a um, very, very accomplished wrestler. And you see it translate into a lot of his fights in the UFC where he just fucking you know, like manhandles dudes. Here he is, and you can see some pretty blatant muscularity. And as he moves forward, um, we see Kamaru Usman through the years. We see him at the Ultimate Fighter finale here, already looking fucking mean, dude. So his physique throughout his UFC progression hasn't necessarily changed that significantly. Maybe he's gotten a little bit more jacked. But the most notable thing is his change in performance metrics, not necessarily his body composition. So his body composition, again, the acne thing and you know the uh is the main like metric and him just being jacked as fuck are the main metrics people use to evaluate his natty or not status like he's fucking shredded he mentions how he's like six percent body fat 180 um which we're gonna get into soon his his weight we might as well actually just just touch on it now actually he mentions it mentions it in the joe rogan podcast he did and he also mentions how fucked up his knees are which you're gonna be getting into too as far as his ability to actually do cardio and be productive with it. A 180, 88 to 190. A, believe it or not, like for most people that are listening to this, that's on the light side. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, yeah. I know it is. But the thing is, I'm so lean and I'm 180. I'm walking around below 6% body Who fat. Who do you? Oh, wow. Who so 180 under 6% body fat, apparently. And then later in the podcast, which we will get to shortly, he talks about how broken down his uh, back, shoulders, knees are. And that obviously comes into play because again, how are you going to increase your endurance without doing significant endurance work? And if your knees are fucked up, like one of the main things, let's just fucking talk about it now. We're already here actually. It's to fuel mm. me the best, to make me help, help me feel the best. Cause I'm getting older and, and things aren't the same they, the way they how used to be. Now? I'm 31 and I'm gonna be 32 in May. So I'm pretty sure he's 34 now. Uh, <laughs> this was a couple of years ago, by the way. And I'm like, man, I just what, don't what feel What differences like, have you noticed? A, a lot of difference. Yeah. Like at 24, I just fucking wake up at 6 a.m. and I can go for a freaking five mile run like that with nothing. Now I can't do that anymore. Do you think that is age or do you think that is miles? Like all it, the it's, hard it's, training? It's a, com it's a combination. Because 31, you're in your athletic prime. Yeah, it's a combination of both because in wrestling years, I, I got to be in the late 40s. Wrestling I mean, he's wrestling years. Right, right. I'm uh, late for it. I mean, back is is a shot. My, you know, my shoulders are shot. My knee, my knees. Oh my God, my knees. I've had five knee surgeries. Jesus Christ. Yeah. I saw you limping. Did you have one recently? I just had surgery. Actually, um, I had surgery on Tuesday. Oh, um, that's a hernia, last Tuesday, right? I had a double hernia. Jesus. Yes. So did you fight with a double hernia? Uh, I tore it before, like five weeks before the fight, and um, but I don't know if it was completely off. You had a hernia but, and a broken foot for yeah, that fight? That yeah. is fucking crazy. The funny thing is, and, and Ali makes fun of me about this, my manager, is uh, like all fight week, like if you saw me, you would think this guy was like a zombie. Like I I'm, I limp around, I freaking lidocaine patches on me, and I'm in a boot or, or sleeve. And, and all I do all day is I go do the media rounds or whatever I need to do training come back and i'm just in my room either game ready on me or or something on me but when i walk through that door to fight the nigerian nightmare wakes up i flip the switch and a lot of people would would if they go back and look at videos so he mentions how his age as an athlete is probably in his 40s given how beat up he is and he says his knees are fucking like the worst he says he's had like five knee surgeries or whatever and he can't run he can't run like he used to and you can imagine that trying to improve your cardiovascular endurance would be quite problematic if your knees are so destroyed 
that you can't even, you know, go for runs anymore and you've had five knee surgeries. And he's so beat up that, you know, a lot of the things you would otherwise need to do to enhance your athletic performance would be more difficult. So this is one of the things that people use to point to his potential EPO use because his endurance has increased quite dramatically since his, since his entrance into MMA. Like from the Ultimate Fighter, um, he was having issues with uh, gassing out and then shortly thereafter and with his, uh, you know, working with the Black Zillions, he was able to significantly improve some of these metrics that otherwise almost reminds you of like a Costa situation. Like the guy had like no gas tank and then like, again, like Costa still has gas, gassing out issues, but they're not nearly as dramatic as they were in the Ultimate Fighter. And like shortly thereafter, all of a sudden, this is something that Faraz Sahabi touched on many times as his reason for justifying why he thinks Costa's on PEDs is the blatant increase in endurance and, you know, um, oxygen carrying capacity and whatnot. So for Usman, you see something very, very similar in his progression. And again, historically, he has worked with training camp that had a lot of individuals that were either admitted for using PEDs, caught using PEDs, looked like they fucking used PEDs. Guys like Overeem, guys like Anthony Johnson, guys like Rashad Evans. Uh, who else? They had uh, Bigfoot, Tiago Silva, Belfort at one point, um, Braulio, Braulio Estima, um, Rumble, as mentioned already. I think Rumble Johnson even said in a uh, um, an interview here, he said, pay us like MLB stars and we won't have to use performance enhancing drugs. UFC 172's Anthony Johnson. This is a long time ago, by the way, but it's just like giving context to the individuals that he was, Usman was training with when he was like first coming into the scene. Anthony Johnson was a recent guest on Sirius XM's Tap Out Radio and he had a unique take on PED use and MMA. And you can bet it's far different from any perspective you may have heard before. The use of illegal steroids in TRT and mixed martial arts is always a hotbed topic. Take Vitor, for example. Um, in every sport, people are using something, he told host Ricky Bones. I mean, as long as nobody dies, nobody pulls a Chris Benoit, you know what I'm saying? I think everything is going to be fine. If it's something that can absolutely help you, I don't see what the problem is. Until that moment, you go crazy on the person, whoever it may be. You can't absolutely blame the, I don't know, I guess it's just an iffy situation. If you abuse it, of course, you're going to get popped for it and do stupid stuff. But if you use it the right way and you just do what you were supposed to do, then it shouldn't be a problem. But with the way the world is right now, hell, you can. Everything is all messed up right now. I don't know, man. I think if you can do it, do it. I don't have nothing against it. You know what I'm saying? As long as you don't kill nobody. A cavalier response from the Black Zillion fighter. Most refreshing when compared to the usual stock replies that we often hear about the subject. Well, uh, Johnson is apathetic towards the topic. That doesn't mean certain athletes in sport are above his suspicion. I told my manager and stuff. I was like, dude, I know these guys work out hard and stuff like that. That's what we do. But I'm like, ain't no way in hell anybody's supposed to go 25 minutes in a championship fight all out like that without gassing out sometime, gassing some type of way. Johnson said, even if you pace yourself, those dudes be ready for another three rounds after five rounds. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. They got to be taking something. You got to take something, even if it's legal or illegal. With as much training as we do, you have to take something. I mean, it doesn't have to be illegal, but you have to do something <laughs> because you just can't say, I'm going to go home and sleep and just wake up in the morning and feel better. It doesn't work like that. Um, so mainly, the main thing is the statement of pay us like MLB stars and we won't have to use PEDs. Like obviously a pretty fucking bold statement. And this is one of the um, guys that Kamaru Usman was... Uh, training with. So back when he first started his journey, he was with these guys um, tightly. Usman found new purpose in MMA with a burgeoning super camp. The Black Zillions represented combat athletes at every career stage. So the Black Zillions, and I'm pretty sure in this, you can actually see, I'm pretty fucking sure this is Rumble Johnson, like literally right there. And then he has his first fight, uh, the ultimate fighter, and if you go through some of these fights in the Ultimate Fighter, you see, uh, you know, you get an idea of what his gas tank is like compared to now when he has these championship fights, um, as well as even when he was just fighting, you know, three rounds um, compared to his bouts in the Ultimate Fighter. And you had uh, the individuals coming to uh, some pretty fucking prominent guys who are highly speculated to be, you know, prominent juicers were basically all around him at all times and many guys who've actually been uh who've been you know some people who have been uh put under the spotlight for it specifically you know some individuals that obviously were more just speculated about it but some individuals that had like pretty fucking blatant 
um, aberrations in their performance and their body compositions and everyone kind of knew it was like a bit hush hush, but people just fucking knew what was going on in this, um, this uh, camp had a pretty blatant reputation. And this is evidenced in a lot of the comments that I got over the past year trying to, you know, elaborate on what to watch out for, um, what sort of like background this guy has in terms of where he's been training, who is coaching him. Notable as well as the fact that the uh, Black Zillions, along with, um, I believe it's American Top Team, ATT, were involved in the Biogenesis Clinic drug scandal and numerous other scandals, apparently. Um, and this is just more like curation of information. Again, just to give some more further context on the situation before we dive into the specific claims by Covington and some of the pharmacology actually in question here. There was even mention at one point about specifically hiring a, like I've mentioned many times, how getting away with some of the stuff in the involvement of pharmacology requires a, almost like a chemist in your corner, an individual who's not necessarily a coach for your actual athletic endeavors for um, like your conditioning coach or your strength coach or anything like that, but rather a PED coach who essentially designs the regimen for you, procures designer drugs or makes them himself or whatever it is. And apparently, again, the Black Zillion supposedly had a guy named Dr. Douglas Kalman. Now, is that accurate? Is that not? Either way, I'm just iterating all of the different speculation and some of the names that were thrown around. Um, and Henry Hooft is one of the individuals who is um, often thrown into the mix for being the guy who essentially mans the ship and is uh, you know facilitating a lot of this stuff. Now, obviously that's all just very, very speculative and stuff thrown out. No one can prove that yes or no. No one can say for certain, but that is what has floated around the MMA community for years at this point. And the main thing is the individuals that Usman surrounded himself with and right when his performance really took off, but again, it was like the start of his career. So was that just natural progression or is that the individuals he's associating himself with? But at the end of the day, you know, he is associating himself with individuals that are definitely on the radar big time. And it sort of, you know, calls into question exactly what's going on. and makes you a little bit more suspect than usual. And again, his knockout power, another thing that is often brought up is the fact that he developed seemingly later in his career knockout power, where it's either one of those things people say you're either born with it or not. And it's something he seemed to develop and kind of bring out of nowhere and became a very, very uh, like prominent um, part of his arsenal, essentially, but is otherwise a very, very odd thing to have happen in the latter half of your development rather than having it, you know, like from scratch, essentially something that's inherently individual to you, like something that you're otherwise born with, essentially not genetically necessarily, but something that you have um, as a trait to start. He seemed to develop it out of nowhere down the line a bit. Now, again, get, getting back to his physique and the development, it's not like, again, he's looked that much different. There's no blatant changes in his physique that make you really, you know, wonder what happened at this specific point. All of a sudden, everything changed so dramatically in his body composition that you can go as far back as, you know, wrestling fucking 10 plus years ago, uh, 174 pounds, Kamaru Usman. It's like, you know, is he competing at still competing at like welterweight division right now. But again, one of the things that he brings up too when he gets accused of PEDs is the fact that he looks exactly the same. He's mentioned that he looks exactly the same. And again, he has looked exactly the same. So that's definitely in his favor and definitely makes you think, okay, well, there's no significant blatant differences. So maybe he hasn't used gear. But what you have to take into account too is how many individuals don't look like they've taken anything who've been popped in the past. I often bring up the Anderson Silva example because he's an individual who's popped for Masteron. And this is an individual who frankly looked better in some of his earlier fights when he didn't pop for shit. You know, when he ended up popping, he did not have a physique that was dramatically different. So it makes you really wonder like, okay, you started around the test before or were you actually natural prior or are you just juicing this entire time? And this is when you got caught because again, Getting popped for a synthetic compound like that, not exactly a smart thing to be using in the UFC, which has like reasonably fucking strict testing. Like it's not easy to get around it. Like even if you're stating 
how you might do it and like where there's shortcomings. Like there's loopholes that are still hard to fucking come by. Like it's not like you can just take master on track, clear it out of your system. Like you're still subject to randomized testing. So again, if you're a Brazilian and maybe you have a big fucking in with the, you know, individuals from a political space, you know, we talked about the, that in the Costa video and that's a very, very notable thing from the political kind of like a corruption standpoint that when you sat a test individuals in international countries, they have to employ the country's representatives, some company in that country of origin to then do the test on their behalf, not necessarily them flying in and like randomly parachuting in and testing you. So in the Brazilians case, you know, individuals that were always scrutinized, like Connor used to scrutinize um, Aldo said he was getting away with it because he otherwise had Brazilians coming to test him. Um, Costa, same deal. Uh, with Anderson Silva, you know, could that have been the case too? Not to say for certain, but again, that's something to be considered when individuals are popping for shit that really doesn't make, like, you would not be smart to be using. But again, at the end of the day, there are a lot of individuals who popped for shit in the UFC that you would not think wow, their physique looked way different in that fight than in any other fight where they were totally clean, supposedly. So just because you've looked the same your whole career, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't have significant ergogenic properties that you can take advantage of from the exogenous anabolics at a 170 welterweight cap. Like just because you're not gaining weight or gaining significant size, it's not like you aren't reaping the benefits of a you know hematology boost, of a motor unit recruitment boost, of a... Um, like actual motor skill acquisition, like trying to actually reinforce the like skill set that you have in the ring and getting more reps in because you're enhancing your recovery. If you can get more gym sessions in and recover quicker, not get sore as often, not have to take as much time off, you can get back in and get like pr do productive fucking reps of stuff again. Like you can actually like progress as a fighter and like acquire your skills and reinforce the like foundations of them and develop them to like a very very skillful level in a much more expedited time frame by having this additional recovery capacity in your corner despite the fact that you're not necessarily gaining weight or gaining sheer amounts of size that are representative of anabolic steroids it doesn't mean you're not reaping the advantages of it in a hematology endurance aggression stress resilience like all those different contexts they're all different vectors of performance that aren't as like blatantly cosmetically obvious but they're still fucking there, especially the recovery, massive difference. Like even for guys who were on TRT, huge fucking difference in the ability to recover where you have no dips. When you're cutting weight, you have no crashing of your hormones. Everything stays exactly where you need it to be. You have no issues if you have a shitty night of sleep, if you're depriving yourself of nutrients, if you have a hard training session. Like people are doing such catabolic stuff in this sport. Like gear would almost be necessary just to stave off muscle loss, like realistically. So for me, like, again, there's a reason why um, Lance Armstrong, he used fucking gear. Did he look like he used gear? No, because look at what the sport imposed on him from a demands aspect. He was using it to just maintain a certain level of performance and get certain properties out of the anabolics, but not necessarily leveraging it in a way to like bulk up. So it's not like these things just make you bulk up. They can reinforce even bone mineral density. Like there's a lot of shit that goes into it. And that's not even getting into the recombinant human growth hormone, not getting into the recombinant EPO. Like we're just talking about androgens here. So again, the main thing he gets called out for is steroids and EPO. Would he be using GH2? Is it a no-brainer to be doing potentially, especially with how much injuries he has? Absolutely. Doesn't mean that's what he's doing though. <laughs> that's where I can get into. I'm just trying to lay out all the fucking facts, dude. Another thing that is normal is notable is the fact that he has a pharmacy background not him specifically but his family does so Usman was born in Nigeria his father became a pharmacist in the U.S. now I'm not necessarily asserting like it's just worthwhile any kind of pharmacology background is worth bringing up now his father was apparently um incarcerated for something that wasn't necessarily his fault which was kind of shitty um, and he talks about it in a more elaborate detail in the Joe Rogan podcast, definitely worth a watch and a, uh, unfortunate debacle that unfolded. Um, but anyways, I digress. I recommend you watch that to get his insight on that situation. But he also has two brothers, Kashidu and Mohammed. Kashidu, hopefully I'm saying that right, is a doctor of pharmacy. So he has a brother too, who is heavily involved in pharmaceuticals. 
definitely notable. While Mohammed is a mixed martial artist. So you're like, huh, you have a dad as a pharmacist, or, you know, obviously he's not actively involved with what he's doing, but you also have a brother who followed in his father's footsteps and is currently a doctor of pharmacy who like you would imagine that's like relatively advantageous to understand how drugs work as a professional athlete. In addition, having a brother who is also a professional MMA fighter who looks like this. I don't think a lot of people know that Usman has a brother who also fights who looks like fucking this dude. This guy is a truck thick and a half. So he has the older brother who is a doctor of pharmacy and then he has this beef stick of a brother who's a fighter as well. So again, like some people might say this is like natty ver or natty versus juiced or, you know, juice versus natty. But again, not everyone responds the same. And some people have more leeway with shit given the league and the parameters that they're in. So again, if you're fighting in like fucking pride and they're telling you to juice, obviously you're gonna go full tilt. If you're in the UFC and you have very, very stringent parameters to stay between, you're gonna go a bit more easy. It might be going in the microdose department. I'm not necessarily saying that's what's happening, but I will give what I would bet on Shortly, more context. He has a jacked as fuck, pretty fucking saucy looking brother who also fights as a professional fighter. And then we have the doctor of pharmacy brother, obviously another red flag for sure. And when it comes to designer drugs, again, is that something you can't do now? Can you not pull a Balco in current day? Frankly, I think it's easier nowadays. I think you have more access to literature than you've ever had ever. Back then you had to dig through fucking libraries to find abandoned designer Frankenstein compounds and resurrect them based on literature you would dig through the library to find or through archives of certain things it's a lot harder to get your hands on. And nowadays you have the entire depths of the internet. You have literal chemists on like fucking Alibaba. You can just call and like ask, pay like 30 grand and ask for like a designer compound to be made. Like there's so much shit you can be doing nowadays that it's impossible for you SATA and WADA to stay 100% on top of it. They can get as close as they can and get very, very, you know, stay on track with shit as it pops up, but certain things they don't even know exist. Somebody tweaking a 19 nor derivative and then making a novel compound that's literally never had an assay developed to it actually detect it. Like what the fuck are you going to do? You know what I mean? All you can do is again, and this is why I don't understand why WADA or USADA does not implement things like gonadotropins. Like if I'm going to be catching people on designer drugs, like I'm not going to catch them with my urine analysis that has the anabolic steroids we're aware of, I'm gonna catch them based on red flags in suppression markers, in things that are otherwise not being tested for for some reason. Like why is the biological passport only hematology? It makes no fucking sense to me. I could be having an IGF-1 biomarker longitudinal data for catching growth hormone usage. I could have a fucking gonadotropin output marker for seeing when they're suppressed and what for how long rather than just looking at a t to epi t ratio and even when there's a weird t to epi t ratio how many times are they following up on it when it's on the opposite side of the spectrum they're only following up when the t ratio is so exceeding the epi t that it is const constitutes a likely testosterone usage example but when it's low as fuck like with john jones they don't follow up on it you know so again some of the guidelines I think have to be manipulated to be more stringent, to be more bulletproof, but the designer compound angle is definitely there. Do I think that's what he's doing necessarily? Like he has a brother who is well-versed in the realm of pharmacology. He has another brother who is, looks like a walking fucking pharmacy <laughs> to be honest. And um, designer drugs are a lot more easy to come by than they used to be back in the uh, Balco days. And even back then, they had a hard time like figuring shit out when there was a lot, well, like frankly, I guess the testing parameters were a lot less uh, you know, elaborate too. But again, like trying to find out that somebody's on a designer drug when you're not testing for suppression markers is like fucking impossible, dude. You know, like you might see a weird aberration in some of their endogenous steroidogenesis markers, I guess, through their urine and then decide like at that, like what do you even do at that point? You know, you see suppressed like, I don't know, T to epi T, like they, they don't seem to follow up on it. And frankly, even when you're suppressed, your ratios might still be in line to a point where your urine still looks totally clean. So designer drugs is definitely on the table. I think the sudden KO power, the development of cardio output down the line is definitely suspect. And let's get into some of the Covington claims because I think we're at that point now. So um, in the journey to the UFC, obviously Usman has uh, developed some pretty crazy performance improvements that are otherwise... Uh, you know, again, call into question what exactly he's been doing and the um, what his team had him doing throughout his like, you know, rise to 
the top essentially. And Covington has some uh, bold accusations about the team as well as exactly what Usman is doing and who ratted him out. What fight have I been in in the UFC that you've seen as competitive? Email Mick. You barely beat that guy. He sucks. You gassed out in three rounds. Who? E exactly. Email Mick, a guy that nobody cares about. You, you gassed man. out in three rounds. Listen, gassed out. bottom line is everybody knows you're everybody on thought my last fight was going to be dollars If you could pee in a cup right now and it, and it, and it passes. Put your money I up. I will. I'll put Where's it up money? right now. Bring it out. Pull I'll it up. I'll put it up right now. 25 grand. Is the money sitting in your right private now. jet? It actually it is, buddy. And uh, just... So, you know, obviously that's stupid because you would not... Like, again, when you think of, like, the maturation of... Like, even developing your oxygen carrying capacity through the use of EPO, this is, like, a multi-week process. This is something that you're not going to have improvements in your hematocrit and whatnot, like, instantly anyways. So to think he would be on EPO literally sitting at the fucking event, like obviously <laughs> ridiculous, and that would be a horrible waste of money that he would definitely pass at that point. Uh, I don't even know why he said that, but um, he's pretty confident that he's doing this. Just obviously the claim of the timing was just like ridiculous, but he's very, very adamant on the fact that he's on shit. I know you gave Glenn a heart attack for all those years you were, you were ducking me, so... Don't worry, he'll be watching from hell on December 14th. First of all, can you even read? I went to D1 scrub, you went to D2. <laughs> Good joke. Not. Colby, I, I did want to follow up on that. Why, why do you feel this way about Kamara? Like what, uh, you know, why are you bringing these sort of topics up? Everybody knows uh, the Black Zillions team is notorious for doing steroids. You know, Anthony Johnson, Rashad Evans, all, all the guys over there, Alistair over him when he was over there. You know, I, I have inside information that, you know, he was doing EPO for a couple years, and, and that's just that. That's a fact, you know. He, he has no good response. He can't even defend himself. So I think it's pretty clear he's on steroids. But it's not going to make a difference because when I get my hands on him, he will melt. Okay, so that was uh, almost that's two years ago at this point. So now we, we're going progressively. Covington is, he's been adamant about this for fucking years. Here's a December 12th, 2019. Um, he specifies some more details about the doping, supposedly. He hasn't failed a USADA test, at least that we know of. I mean, we're, we're not aware of anything like that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of secondhand uh, knowledge. You know, a lot of his teammates have told me that. And I mean, look at his physique. Look at the, look at the fight in the Emil Meek fight when he gassed out in three rounds and then he, he goes five hard rounds with Tyrone Woodley. I mean, it's night and day different person, but you know, and USADA, you know, they don't even test. They didn't even test me one time leading up to this fight. And I mean, I, they know I'm clean. That's probably why they didn't test me, but where's the testing, you know? Like, I mean, I love USADA. I love D Jeff DeWinski, but come on guys, let's be honest. USADA works for the UFC. So you really think that the UFC is gonna, gonna pull a main event or test a guy that could potentially fail their test and ruin their business? I don't think so. Did is you that think about asking for an EPO test? Did you think about saying, hey, can you guys do this? So, okay, I'll let him finish. <laughs> I have a point to make. I did ask for it, you know, I, I asked extensively to USADA behind, you know, in emails and whatnot. And, you know, I was hoping they were going to do it. I was willing to pay 25 grand to, to Usman if he could piss, piss clean in a cup in New York, but he couldn't do it. He just completely avoided the subject. I brought it up twice to him and he just acted like he couldn't even, he couldn't even deny it. So well, I think it showed his reaction at the press conference. He's obviously on steroids. Okay, so again, like the lack of testing. So there definitely is, they're subject to randomized testing and it's relatively frequent given the budget constraints and the location of some of these guys and whatnot. But again, it's not as comprehensive as it would need to be to be, like there's no real bulletproof method, but again, it's not comprehensive enough to be bulletproof enough by, I don't know, like I guess my standard to actually rule out a lot of like really obvious shit. Like I just mentioned the gonadotropins and the designer drugs. Um, Cody Garbrandt was on Rogan recently, relatively recently, and he mentioned how there was like a complete lack of, or a relative lack of testing and even the lack of blood testing too. They would just be like urine. And that's like, again, like the biological passport is one of the most hyped up things to actually detect aberrations in hematology, to actually assess if somebody might be doing a transfusion or deploying EPO. And then subsequent to that, you would actually, you know, test for EPO. But again, if you're not being blood tested, there's no red flags to go off of, you know? So if you're just getting your urine tested, it's not being subject to um, HGH, isoform differential amino assay. If it's not being subject to EPO analysis, these things are 
more specialized, expensive tests that are brought on as after red flags of shit in general, like with the blood matrix, for example, with the EPO, subsequent like HGH testing is going to be just like random as fuck. But EPO testing, like we're basing it off of the biological passport. And if you're not even developing it, what do you like? When are you going to test? It's never going to happen and above and beyond that, unless I guess somebody like rats somebody out and they feel it's, you know, warrants actually addressing it specifically. Or if an athlete, notably, goes into their career understanding how the biological passport works, just because you have a bunch of longitudinal data points as USADA, it doesn't mean that it's representative of a non-doping athlete if it's within a certain reference range, if they knew about how this shit worked before they even came into the league. So if you've been testing your blood, testing your shit on a regular basis and creating your own biological passport going into the league, could you not skirt around that entirely and create your own minute little reference range of micro dosing? Sure. And is it being done? Absolutely, in my opinion. Moving on to the next claim, this was um, around the same time frame. Yeah, I wanted to headline that fight card, but Marty Fake Newsman had to clear the EPO out of his system. So, you know, why don't you go ask Marty Fake Newsman? It wasn't just me that he turned down. He turned down Leon Scott. He turned down journeyman George Mosfidal. So he didn't want to fight anybody in New York, and he's gonna not going to want to fight anybody ever again after this weekend in Vegas. And your opinion, where is Usman getting these performance-enhancing drugs? Is he on these performance-enhancing drugs? What are his sources? What are your sources? Ah, uh, well, he, you know, my sources, are, you know, I've heard a lot of secondhand from a lot of his training partners that have said, you know, they know for a fact he's on EPO and he, he's been doing steroids his whole career. And, you know, I think his strength coach is like a, is a doctor. And then also he has another guy that used to train at our gym. I can't remember the guy's name, but he used to do all, give all the guys steroids, you know, back in the day in the MMA world. So, you know, you might want to look into that guy. Interesting. Now, Tyron Woodley, if you get the W Saturday evening, where does he sit? Okay, so that was 2019. Now we moved to more recently. This is literally a few months ago, and we are readdressing the accusations and what he thinks currently about EPO use in Usman. Is he still the CEO of EPO? What's going on? Is he still doping? What's up? Well, people love a great rivalry, man. But going back to, well, arguably the biggest rivalry right now, you and Usman, um, I have to ask you this, man, because obviously everybody loves the nicknames that you give people, uh, and you've dubbed him as the CEO of EPO. Obviously, EPO a lot in the headlines lately um, with you know TJ Dillashaw's return and stuff. Where where exactly does that stem from? Why, why is he the CEO of EPO? Because he's been doing EPO his whole career. It's so obvious, you know, his chemical imbalance in his body. You know, he's got the pimples all over his back, all over his face. You're a 35-year-old man. You don't have – you're not going through puberty and you're in your teens anymore. You should not be having that chemical imbalance and that breakout, you know. That's from his testosterone and, 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 um, and, and being out of whack, you know. And his estrogen to testosterone levels are out of whack. So – you know, he is the CEO of EPO. I've heard firsthand from some people that he trained with, some people that I might have went to wrestle to college with that said the same thing. They could they could verify it, that he has done EPO and he's injected it in his asshole, in his ass, not his asshole, excuse my <laughs> language there, but he's, he's uh, you know, injected in his ass. So he's the CEO of EPO. He's Marty Juiceman. Is that a concern for you? Uh, you know. Okay, so a few things to note there. If you have breakout as a result of a testosterone and estrogen imbalance, like he could... Colby clearly doesn't understand the difference between steroids and EPO, like whatsoever, the way he's describing this shit. Like, I'm sure he has a rudimentary understanding of how EPO enhances endurance and steroids are good for being jacked and like muscle. But the like, the overlap of his statements, like, if you're going to call somebody out, you got to be like pretty fucking specific about saying, like, this is why you have acne. This is why, this is what you're injecting in your ass. Like, you would not be pinning intramuscular EPO into your ass. You would be pinning your gear there potentially. But again, as mentioned before, with potentially what TJ Dillashaw was doing with the subcutaneous administration of Procrit, that is a like the worst way you could be, be administering it from a pharmacokinetics and detection aspect if you want to get far more aggressive spikes in serum concentrations and get a much shorter window of detection, you would go the intravenous route, which is what any smart athlete would be doing who's using EPO to begin with. So again, he would not be pinning it in his ass. He'd be pinning it like directly fucking mainline into a system or at worst subcutaneously in belly fat. That would not be a spot to be pinning it. Like, I guess you could do intramuscular, but I mean, like you don't need to. And if you were trying to get around testing, it would be the probably the 
not the ideal spot. You'd be doing it intravenously and it's not like it's something you need to do like every fucking day anyway. So it might not be that. If you're getting a significant advantage from it and you're shortening your detection window by a fairly significant amount, like there are a lot of guys who are going to justify mainline, mainlining it over a sub Q or an IM administration. Now, as far as pinning gear in his ass, like, yeah, that's definitely possible. But I'll let him continue. You know, when fighting him? No, because I felt it before. I know what he, when it comes to the table. You know, I know he's going to be doing it. You know, there's ways to get around the test. They're not blood testing. You know, they're doing a piss test here and there. Okay, so that's notable, too, is the fact that even he's saying they're not doing a lot of blood testing. And they're basically just doing urine lately. So if that's the true... And they're not assessing the biological passport as they've stated they do to be more comprehensive. Much more leeway for EPO. And frankly, even if they had the biological passport, again, mentioning the longitudinal data going into the UFC to get around it, as well as can it even detect microdosing to begin with, the literature I mentioned at the beginning we're going to get into shortly. They're not going to blood test and they're going to let him get away with it. But, you know, you got to live with those with that the rest of your life. You gotta live with that on your conscience that you had to cheat your whole way through your career. I know I'm an all natural American. I, I worked the hard way, you know, blue collar, earned it, blood, sweat, and tears. You know, this is this is earned to the very core, to the very root, naturally. I didn't cheat, I didn't cut corners. I took the long way to get here. So, you know, he has to live with that. He's gonna have problems later in life, you know, his organs, all that stuff's gonna shut down. You know, he's 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 taking years off his life, but that's the choice he has to live with. If that's what he wants to do, that's what he's doing. But you cannot stop destiny. And this is destiny. November 6th is destiny. Colby Chaos Covington will be the UFC welterweight champion in the world. And there's not a steroid in the world that can stop it. Okay, so like I mentioned with the the EPO, the uh <laughs> the gear one thing also notable that i almost forgot to mention is and it's definitely just just worthwhile to mention as another point um i thought it was kind of interesting is uh somebody dm me saying discover you, your youtube channel a few months ago i've been binge watching all your content whenever i get the chance solid info anyway i came across something interesting today i saw that kamaro usman left a comment on the personal page of a guy that owns a trt clinic in boca raton florida so if you zoom in you can see here Usman, 84 kilogram clapping emoji. So, you know, very like random, relatively small page for the welterweight champion in the world to be commenting on. The guy is SJG Core. And if you scroll down, we see here um, the CEO of Core Medical Group, which is, uh, let's see, if you go look at the page exactly. It is a national clinic, a top HRT, TRT clinic, proud, proud supporter of US military. And yeah, like literally within their first two lines of feed posts, you can see um, testosterone cypionate, uh, let's see, some sort of, uh, was it a GNRH agonist? I can't really tell what this is, hard to read, but you can see pretty fucking clearly test sip and they are like a TRT clinic. So I'm um, just kind of interesting that um, Usman is commenting on the owner of a TRT clinics page on his personal, like small page. Now, again, it doesn't necessarily mean you can't use a TRT clinic for services like, I don't know, like vitamin administrations, um, like any, like there are a lot of things that are legal in the UFC. You could be using these clinics for, so it doesn't necessarily reflect like, Oh, like caught him. This is definitely like who he's using for his, his like test and blah, blah, blah. But it was worth noting nonetheless that it was just kind of like, if you put that out there, maybe it's so obvious and in the public, you wouldn't even think, you wouldn't be so dumb as to put a comment out on a guy you're like getting your shit from, obviously. So I highly doubt it's anything, but it was just worth noting nonetheless. So anyways, now we get into the actual pharmacology of shit. So developing the knockout power, improving his cardio despite having completely dismantled knees and being wrecked and being like a, you know, a 40 plus year old in terms of his infrastructure, what are you gonna benefit from the most? Like obviously my breakdown of HGH that I've done many times and some of my more recent, my more recent UFC breakdowns is uh, that's fucking on the table for sure. Reinforcing the structural integrity of your body and it's very hard to detect. Even when Mirko Krokop literally admitted to using GH, they still didn't detect it. They literally, they literally penalized him for admitting it, not even because they could detect it. So even when you fucking did, like admit it and they test you, they still couldn't find it. So that just shows how very, very like exact the fucking testing needs to be to find something like HGH. And it's why so few individuals pop for it. 
And it's also, frankly, a test that I highly doubt they roll out very often. This is a test that's more um, a high analytical technique using isoform differential immunoassay. They're not using biomarker testing like they should be, in my opinion. Um, and even when they do it, like how often do they roll it out if they're not even using a consistent blood matrix for the biological passport? Probably almost never. So I bet there's a ton of fucking guys in the UFC right now. There's definitely a lot of guys in the UFC doing it as well as sports like the NBA and other sports using growth hormone because it is ultimately like how, why is it that athletes are suddenly able to extend their careers into their forties and still maintain high performance or more notably, avoid injury for as long as possible, avoid complete degradation of their infrastructure. One of the main things is human growth hormone. And that is something that, again, like I think should be, like it's not that performance enhancing necessarily. Like, yeah, you get some like satellite cell proliferation, you can get some additional myonuclear donation. There are certain things that are going to be helpful from a muscle building aspect for sure. But mainly it's like a, proactive like injury protection mechanism essentially or something that's going to expedite recovery and i think frankly should be like allowed you know like why are you subjecting guys to fuck themselves up in fights fuck themselves up in sports get like wrecked on a football field and then you like want to prevent them from having access to shit that is going to help them recover like even peptides that are not banned are being reclassified as like biologics now and they're getting harder to access and you're having guys being forced to go to like research chemical websites just to get shit as basic as BPC-157 potentially. Like it's fucked up, dude. Like I think people should just have access to this regardless. And I'm fucking sure that Usman has seen his fair share of BPC, TB-500, et cetera, in his heyday for his injuries. Because, And that is something that's definitely worth noting. But this is going to be a main discussion about the heavy hitters that you guys are going to be interested in, which is the bioidentical compounds that you would typically like associate with PEDs. I can almost promise shit is on the table like BPC-157, things that are going to be um, peptides that enhance recovery, injury prevention, etc. There's a fuck ton I'm sure he's on, as is. But some of those are allowed, but they're like worth noting that they're like PEDs technically. But the main things we're going to be talking about, again, endogenous versus exogenous testosterone. Do I think he's necessarily abusing gear? Not really. I think HGH is 100% in, in this fucking context, something that would be worthwhile for him to be using. And I'm sure I would, I would be shocked if he's not using it, put it that way. In addition to that, the CEO of EPO, the fact that um, like a lot of times people can throw claims around and sometimes they end up holding weight. And years later, you find out that there was actually a like people weren't like when you hear cumulative, cumulatively rumors from multiple individuals, oftentimes there's, you know, a reason for it. And sometimes it's just, you know, talking shit, but sometimes it might actually be legit. And with Usman getting sudden knockout power or being able to stay highly uh, athletic and on point and not gassing out in later rounds, like shortly after working with this, you know, like suspect, you know, team of individuals potentially, or just having blatant changes in his performance shortly after his career started when he showed blatant weaknesses in many areas that completely flipped the script shortly into his career and in his mid thirties, he's still improving. You know, is EPO on the table? I definitely think so too. I'm not gonna say for certain that's exactly what he's doing, but I think if anything, where you have no blatant, like again, the body composition changes, that's something again, you can't just chalk up to using gear versus not. But if you're gonna have something that's going to be blatantly performance enhancing, that's not going to have any changes to your physique and make you push into the next weight class, obviously EPO is going to be more useful than anabolic steroids in that regard. While they both increase erythropoiesis, obviously straight up EPO is going to be more useful for a guy who is like jacked as fuck and can barely like, has a hard time making weight to begin with and walks around at like 186%, you know what I mean? So can you get away with EPO? I've already mentioned the lax HGH or non-existent HGH testing, but we at least know people have been popped for EPO in the UFC, right? But can you get away with microdosing it? Now again, the lack of the biological passport already indicates you could get away with recombinant EPO like fucking willy nilly, easily. However, let's just say they are testing. Can you get away with microdosing? Yes, you can. And this is very, very obvious in the literature where it literally, you can literally find current markers of athlete blood passport do not flag microdose EPO doping. So this is similar to the uh, literature I showed on the leeway you could have with the testosterone to epitestosterone ratio with exogenous testosterone use, which again, 
Would that play into it here? You know, you could definitely be using tests too. And again, if you're going to be skirting around these tests, your best options in general, in some aspects are going to be bioidenticals. So again, with him, like, would you be using a fucking master on like Anderson Silva? Like, unless you thought you could get away with, you know, getting around tests entirely. No, you'd be leveraging bioidenticals if you're in the, in the, if you're in the USA and you're being tested by USADA randomly, you're not going to fuck around with synthetics that are literally on the banned substance list. You're either going to be using designer drugs or bioidenticals. So again, when you have individuals literally IVing the shit into their systems and being tested to see if they can get away with it, they find that there's a substantial financial burden, significant logistical obstacles associated with collecting, transporting, and analyzing fresh blood samples in compliance with the WADA guidelines. Meanwhile, anecdotal evidence and admissions from several athletes suggest that athletes have already learned to avoid detection by using small, frequent injections of recombinant humo human EPO. Our findings demonstrate that it is possible to inject recombinant human EPO without triggering passport thresholds. And that's even if you have existing longitudinal data. Imagine you go into the UFC understanding how the shit works and you've already developed your own like very minute reference range and you know how much you can be dosing rather than going in with a fresh slate and then taking your EPO and still fucking passing it. That's what we're seeing here. So our findings demonstrate it is possible to inject it without pat triggering passport thresholds. On one hand, this underlies the need to retain existing analytical procedures, direct detection in support of the athlete blood passport. On the other hand, emphasis emphasizes the need for recruitment of novel strategies to hopefully close current loopholes. Now, again, have these loopholes been closed in? <laughs> As they would suggest, you know, they want to make you think everything's bulletproof and comprehensive. But in reality, as of literally last year and this year, they're still developing more spe specific analytical techniques to try and own in on this shit. Improved detection methods significantly increase the detection window for EPO microdoses. You would hope this is like an old study that has been, you know, I'm just digging up in order to show like, oh, they figured it out. You know, they've definitely got this dialed in by now. No, this is a fucking 2020 study, dude. They're still trying to figure this shit out. When you go to the conclusion of the study, what do you find? You find that this is something that's not even being implemented by WADA right now. This is something they figured out and they're going to try and explain to them why they need to implement it. So if we go down to the... Ba -ba -ba -ba, in this work, the latest technical improvements in EPO detection methods were applied to evaluate the identification of binocrit microdoses in blood and urine after repeated administration. The quality of the profiles, the sensitivity, higher signal noise, and the reproducibility were improved with optimized methods. In addition, criteria for suspicious sample by IEF page were re-evaluated using either IEF page or SDS page. Improved methods and new criteria for IEF page detection of recombinant EPO microdoses was achieved in 100% of the blood samples after 24 hours and the microdoses were still identified in 64 to 82% of the samples after 48 hours. For urines, IEF page method gave quite similar results while SDS page method had the highest detection rate for microdoses after 48 hours. SAR page method tested on representative samples seemed to be as efficient as SDS page. Now, by adopting these improved methods and criteria, if they are approved by WADA, as in they haven't yet, Anti-doping laboratories could benefit from the prolonged window of detection of recombinant EPO microdoses to identify cheating athletes. So again, if this was a dialed in bulletproof process, would they still be developing more specialized analytical techniques to detect this shit? I spit all over my fucking screen, but it's fine. No, they wouldn't. They would have it just dialed in and they just fucking do it. You know, why would you be spending a bunch of funding literally a decade after like again, this, this first detection of microdosing is not necessarily a recent development. This is something they've known for a while and they're still working on it in 2021. So no, this is not dialed in. Can you get away with EPO at ridiculous levels if you're not being tested at all via your blood? Yeah. Can you get away with microdosing even if they're testing your blood? Yeah. Can you get away with potentially like decently dosing it if you actually understand the biological password and understood it going into it and had expert like a doctor of pharmacy or a coach who literally is fucking specializing in the shit and was hired by the team in order to help you do this could you get away with a bit more aggressive use of it yes you could so yes there's still an open window for this this is literally represented in the literature and i would be sure that any individual who had blatant performance improvements like this there's a high likelihood that they are leveraging Bioidenticals like HGH for injury prevention, I think is definitely on the table for Usman, despite the fact that he's the CEO of EPO. I think HGH is the first absolute no-brainer thing for him. 
Um, I think he should be allowed to use that, to be honest. Like, look at, like, why the fuck would you not want the longevity of your fighter? You know what I mean? Like, he's a big money maker in the league, or presumably he is. He's like the top welterweight, and he's a legend in the sport. Like, why would you not want to injury proof him and keep him fighting for longer? Like, you should let him use this shit, in my opinion. The EPO usage, do I think he's potentially doing that? Do I think there's some weight behind what Covington's saying, behind what uh, McGregor's saying? Yeah, I do. I, I would speculate that he probably is. That's my guess. It's an educated guess. It's based on a lot of, uh, you know, context and, um, you know, performance metrics changes and whatnot. But that's my guess, dude. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. All the comments help the algorithm. They're much appreciated. Like, subscribe. Check out my blog, replacementdates.com. Follow me on Instagram, I'm replacementdates. Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. Let me know uh, what you think. All the comments help the algorithm. They're much appreciated. Um, if you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with in the video description below. Um, and that's it. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.